You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Beside the Brook, the story of someone who found the truth, written by Catherine MacDonald. Beside the Brook, Chapter 7, Mr. Sprackling Goes Shopping. The road to Nutswood was narrow, winding, and without a footpath, and along it once a week moved Mr. Sprackling on his timber cart, as serene as a general in a Roman triumph, drawn smartly by a clopping white horse, and followed by an equally fine and clopping black horse at the back. The whole procession extended a considerable length, the carriage itself consisting of twenty-foot beam with crossbars and iron spikes festooned with chains, travelling on red wheels. Snowball, between the shafts, attended by her master perched upon a crossbar, wearing corduroys, blue glasses, and a drooping moustache, enjoyed these occasions immensely for she drew no weight of logs, and the road was firm to her trot. Such conditions enabled her to travel at the speedy rate of seven miles an hour, compared with a crawl of two when she and Queenie strained to pull a load of furs over soft forest tracks. Queenie, bringing up the rear and tethered to the back of the carriage by a single rein, also enjoyed these occasions. Her attendance was not necessary, but as she refused to stay at home, having once kicked a fence down through chagrin at being left behind, and at another time misbehaved to an unbelievable extent on Snowball's return, Mr. Sprackling afterwards took her too, to avoid trouble. Not that trouble was altogether averted by this weekly sallying forth to purchase the timber carter's rations, consisting of six ounces of fat, half a pound of sugar, and the rest of his modest portion. For there was consternation when the equipage suddenly met a double-decker bus at a narrow bend, or a breakdown outfit travelling to the aerodrome. But the point was, the trouble did not affect Mr. Sprackling or his animals, who budged for nothing. Snowball clopped proudly on without altering her pace, her blinkers rending her blind to all diversions, while Queenie in the wake took advantage of her freedom from restraint and responsibility to indulge in a little side-kicking at cyclists unaware of the range of her hind legs. Mr. Sprackling, smoking his pipe and holding a loose rein, had not yet discovered this weakness of Queenie's, so that nothing troubled him on these Saturday shopping excursions, not even when he caused a traffic jam in the narrow high street, and pedestrians backed into doorways out of reach of the black horse's terrible feet. Mr. Sprackling's goal was the market square, where stood a stake to which he could tether snowball, and a trough where the horses might drink. While he sought refreshment for himself, and the chance to buy his few necessities. When he first left the New Forest sawmill at Exley to work in the private timber yard behind Mr. Broom's cottage, he used to take the bus to town, but so often had it passed him by without stopping, and so obvious had been the resentment of the passengers to sit beside Mr. Sprackling in mud and corduroys when it had, that he decided to travel independently in his own carriage. This day there happened to be a hardware stall in the square displaying its goods, although it was not a market today. And the salesman, a brisk, clean-featured man, eyed with misgiving the tethering of such great horses near his brittle wares. "'Would you mind turning the black horse around the other way?' he suggested pleasantly to Mr. Sprackling. Who, surprised that anyone should take exception to his beasts, stared at the speaker. 
A surly-looking lout nearby wagged his head knowingly at Mr. Sprackling and then nodded at the stallholder. "'It don't make any difference to me,' announced Mr. Sprackling at length, heading the horse in the opposite direction. "'Only too glad to oblige.' The stallholder smiled his thanks as the timberman moved off, followed by the lout. Some at be Alice wrong with that tribe, snivelled the latter. He be a Jew, he be. I don't care who he be, so long as I get my business done in town, reported Mr. Sprackling, and I dare say he wants to get his and done too. With this rebuff, the lout took himself off, leaving Mr. Sprackling to seek his purchases. The timber carter carried his money in a soft leather bag drawn together with two strings. His shopping left him with a handful of silver coins, which he dropped carelessly into the open mouth of the bag in his pocket. For being a bachelor, Mr. Sprackling did not need to account for every penny. He ambled around the shops, admiring the fittings in the gas company's shining cell rooms, though he was quite content with a smelly oil burner at home and a tailor's creations, though he had not the slightest intention of buying a suit. He purchased a frying pan, some rat poison, and a lard cake for Sunday tea. Then he made his way back to the market square. Snowball lifted her head and neighed on catching sight of him, while Queenie kicked up sparks on the cobbles with impatience for his return. She had become restive through dislike of the customer's visits to the hardware store, for she was not used to people coming and going. Steady, lass, cautioned her master as she lunged at the bang of a firework let off by a group of boys some distance away. Mr. Sprackling was standing beside the black horse, feeling in his big pockets among his rations to make sure he had not mislaid his precious matches when another firework frightened Queenie into rearing up on her hind legs. He pulled out his hand to seize her halter, and out came the open-mouthed purse, scattering half-crowns, sixpences, and small change over the cobbles. Up ran the hardware merchant to Mr. Sprackling's help. Dodging hither and thither, he retrieved the coins and handed them to the old man, who had already quietened Queenie with a reprimand and a clap on the shoulder. Thank ye, sir. Thank ye, said Mr. Sprackling, pocketing his money while the salesman returned to the, his stall. Then he mounted the crossbar and the procession jingled away. But before the square narrowed to the high street, Mr. Sprackling stopped Snowball and, fetching out his purse, looked doubtfully at its contents. I'm sure it's short, he said, not that he worried much about it, but he did not like to lose money. He counted it out on his corduroy knees. As far as he could make out, he was four and six short, having lost a half crown and a florin. The loitering lout was watching him. Have he lost some it? he inquired. Yeah, I reckon I have, answered Mr. Sprackpin. Must have been when Queenie reared and me money fell out. Where did he lose it? asked the artful fellow. Down near the stall where the timber wagon was fixed. Then he had it, asserted the fellow, pointing with his thumb to the hardware stall. He be a Jew, and Jew be thieves. Don't he trust them? But he helped me pick it up, said Mr. Sprackling. So he would, sneered the lout, and helped himself at the same time. Mr. Sprackling did not like the loiterer and lifted the rein to be off. Now he felt that the fellow might be right. Ye up, Snowball, he said. We won't bother no more about that. And you, he called back to Queenie, you'll better behave yourself on the way home, else you stay behind next week. Saturday afternoon was a holiday for everyone in the timber yard and on the farm except the dairymen, and Mr. Sprackling enjoyed pottering around with his spaniel, 
chatting with one and the other and viewing the weather through clouds of tobacco smoke. He wandered along the brook and saw his houses cropping grass in the paddock and Teddy Ting Tong tending his fire, his flames leapt merrily round the suspended kettle. The smell of a wood fire attracts most people, and now the glow of hot embers and the prospect of a cup of hot tea added to their appeal, so that Mr. Sprackling drew near the shepherd's hut in a happily expectant state of mind. He had made the shepherd's acquaintance before, and liked him, though he could not understand his dislike to sharing tobacco and beer with him. It appeared that Teddy had a visitor, for a pair of long legs in watertight boots protruded from the front door. But this did not deter Mr. Sprackling's approach, for he soon discovered that the owner of the boots was young Summers from Exley Sawmill. Now I should hear how all the volk be up at Exley, thought Sprackling. Just right for a cup of tea, Sprackling, called Teddy Tington. Thank ye, I'm sure, replied that gentleman, seating himself on an upturned bucket. Days be getting cold now, and how be you, young man? he asked, turning to Kenneth. Fine, thank you, Mr. Sprackling. I scarcely need ask how you are. You look hale and hearty as ever. All except for me rheumatics, complained Mr. Sprackling, stretching a leg in the direction of Ginger, who was daintily sniffing the latest comer's boots. Oh, I didn't mean to kick the cat, apologised Mr. Sprackling. Ginger, however, whose fears were justified by the appearance of the spaniel Gip, sought safety by the crooked chimney pot of the shearling. I do carry a slice of raw potato in me pocket for rheumatics, continued Mr. Spracklin, but I don't set much store by him. Feeling in his pocket reminded him of his purse. I've been a town today and lost four and six, he said. That's too bad, said Kenneth. How did it happen? Mr. Sprackling told the tale, while Teddy poured out the tea and handed round ginger nuts. "'Twas that there Jew as had it," asserted Mr. Sprackling, with a nod and a wink. "'Jews be thieves,' he added in a burst of confidence, excited by the taste of the tea. Kenneth's eyes danced. "'Have you any proof?' "'No,' answered Mr. Sprackling, wagging his head. But the fellow nearby said twas he, and I believe him. Do you believe everything everyone says? pursued Kenneth. No, not all us. Because if you do, you'll never have an opinion of your own. But I have heard before that those Jews is very awkward people, ventured Mr. Sprackling. Was Jesus Christ awkward? asked Kenneth. Mr. Sprackling's jaw dropped, and he stared at his questioner. He was not a religious man, but the mention of that name fell on his ear as an echo of simple childhood. What need for he to bring in that? he said at length. Because Jesus Christ was a Jew, replied Kenneth, and I repeat my question. Was he awkward? Mr. Sprackling was nonplussed, but Teddy came to the rescue. I, his enemies, found him awkward, but not his friends, he observed. Kenneth smiled at the shepherd. You are right, Mr. Gray, he said, and the enemies of the Jews are still the enemies of God and his son, Jesus Christ. Mr. Sprackling felt thoroughly uneasy and hoped that the conversation would soon take another turn, but Kenneth was determined to make things plain. Who hated the Jews in Germany, Mr. Sprackling? And what happened to the persecutors? he asked. The timber carter took a noisy draught of tea. The Jews are God's chosen people, whether we like them or not. And the Almighty has said that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Germany has come to disaster, while Britain and her friends who have favoured them have themselves been favoured. Every single person who reviles a Jew just because he is one proclaims himself to be an enemy of God. 
True, they are despised and held up to open shame whenever opportunity offers. But how often do Gentiles also deserve the same treatment? The limelight is focused upon any unfortunate Jew who commits an offence, and people search for trouble where he is concerned. Mr. Sprackling shifted his seat from the bucket to a sawn log to intimate that a change of topic was also desirable, but the subject was not yet exhausted. The fact that they suffered is no more than the Bible has foretold. Thou hast made us as the offscouring and refuse in the midst of the people, said the prophet. The Jews of old deserved it, and their children have inherited the punishment, but they are still God's people and he has promised to gather his outcasts and restore them to honour. Whether Mr. Sprackling followed all this or not was not clear, but he began to appear exceedingly uncomfortable. "'Would it surprise you to hear that I am a Jew?' asked Kenneth suddenly. Mr. Sprackling was beyond surprise, having found something in his pocket which he had mistaken for a slice of potato. "'No,' said he. Not sure whether he ought to have said yes. Not by birth, said Kenneth, but in spirit I am of the family of Christ and therefore inherit the promises made to the Jewish fathers. Here honest Mr. Sprackling produced a half-crown from his pocket and holding it up announced, I'll take back all I said about the Jew. Here's some of the money I lost. And I expect the rest is in the coat lining, laughed Kenneth. Mr. Sprackling rose and revolved slowly so that the bulky hem of his coat might be pinched all around. Here's the florin, said Teddy, along with the potato. Oil be blowed, breathed Mr. Sprackling, beginning to look rather deflated. Twas me own vault after all. Or you put me money in me pocket anyhow. Have another cup of tea, suggested the shepherd. Thank ye, said Mr. Sprackling, handing up his cup, and then relieved that Kenneth had at last completed the defence. He inquired of him, and now be all of old Copperdexley Mill. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.